The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same-game parlays. Find bets in the new Explore tab. Make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays, and more. So, visit FanDuel.com slash 247 and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Must be 21 plus and present in Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, permitted parishes only, Massachusetts, Maryland, Michigan, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, or Wyoming. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text Next Step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland. Visit 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia or call one 800 522 4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York or visit oasas.ny.gov slash gambling. Standard text messaging rates apply. Sports betting is void in Georgia, Hawaii, Utah, and other states where prohibited. Imagine the softest sheets you've ever felt. Now imagine them getting even softer over time. I'm here to tell you about Bowl & Branch Sheets. In a recent customer survey, 96% replied that Bowling Branch sheets get softer with every wash. They're made from the rarest organic cotton and designed to get even softer over time. Try their sheets with a 30-night guarantee plus 15% off your first order with code ODYSSEY. So head to B-O-L-L and branch.com today. Exclusions apply. See site for details. Welcome to the PowerCat Podcast, GoPowerCat.com's Kansas State Athletic Show. Now, here's your host, GoPowerCat publisher, Tim Fitzgerald. Welcome to this edition of the PowerCat Postgame Podcast. Tim Fitzgerald and Cole Carmody in different places because that's how life works once in a while. I am in the Cats and Dogs studio. Cole is at home. He'll be returning to this live here in the greater MHK JC area very soon uh, but he had some personal stuff to handle this weekend amongst covering a very entertaining and competitive football game in Lawrence and Cole let's just jump right in what would you think so you saw it in person I saw it here in the studio but um, that was an interesting game not well played by Kansas State I thought KU played better than K-State overall I thought K-State just had Uh, the right amount of breaks and the right enough playmakers to get it done. I thought KU completely that coaching staff outcoached Chris Kleiman and his staff in the first half. I mean, that was the first time I was sitting up in the press box with our good friend, Tim Everson of the Manhattan Mercury. And I turned to Tim and I go, this is the first time that I think I've seen a Chris Kleiman team get outcoached that badly in a half of football. And it's not that, I don't think K-State had a good game plan. I just think KU had a better game plan. I mean, the way they came out offensively, give credit to that staff because those players were not ready for it. We talked to them after the game, and I I specifically asked Austin Moore after the game, and I I think it was just me and maybe one other reporter. I just, you know, I I put my recorder down, and and he had his rolling next to me. But I said, hey, Austin, like, were you guys expecting that much Speedo and and Wildcat? And he goes, well, we knew they were going to run the Wildcat. We knew they were going to run the Speedo. We practiced it. But we had no idea that it would be almost 50% of the time. And I don't think that's necessarily a reflection on the staff. Um, but I think that's a reflection on Kansas's staff for saying, 
we're going to throw something at them that they're not expecting. And if it yeah. doesn't work, we're going to lose, but we're going to go down guns blazing. Yeah. And they almost pulled it off. I thought it was a brilliant offensive scheme. Uh, the way he mixed in uh, different formations, as you mentioned, uh, took pressure off the young freshman quarterback um, to the point where by the time he needed to make some plays, he had some confidence. I thought it was just overall just really well executed plan by, by Kansas. But K-State eventually got it shut down. I mean, not completely. They, I mean, even on that last drive for KU, they were moving the ball. They were in the red zone, and, and K-State got the interception. But, uh, boy, this was a this was a nail-biter. I, if I'm a KU fan, I'm going to what-if that game quite a while. I mean, they had a pick six that was dropped. I mean, it was nothing but a, a touchdown. He willed in for saw him, apparently, and just wham. So it's uh, – it was an escape act by Kansas State winning 31-27 in Lawrence, but uh, they got out of there with the win. KU's getting a lot better. K-State uh, had some struggles. But this is the first time, Cole, that I really felt like K-State's struggles weren't self-inflicted. Mm-hmm. I thought in Missouri they just didn't line up right and didn't do – it was all things that they could correct. At uh, Oklahoma State, they were just flat. I've never seen a K-State team that flat in a long time, and they just didn't look inspired at all. At Texas, honestly, they looked intimidated for the first quarter plus, uh, and then they settled in and realized this big crowd doesn't make much noise. Let's play with these guys, and and they played better than Texas from that point on. This game, I, I don't have any fault of K-State's effort or desire. We saw it on the first drive. I thought Kansas just took control of this game and and, and put K-State back on its heels. Um, and that's a great compliment to Lance Leipold and um, his entire staff. It was it was really impressive what I saw. But, again, K-State won the 15th in a row. It's going to remain challenging for a while, but um, getting that number 15 is um, was significant. You don't want to be the guys that lost it. No. Nope. You just don't. And nope. congratulations to Philip Brooks and all of the super seniors who came back with a COVID year, Hayden Gillum, all of them. Uh, you now have beaten KU six times. That's insane, what, isn't it? What no other K Stater I think has ever done. So uh, that is pretty cool. It, Cole, it, w- w- go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Will Howard talked about that after the game. I mean, we'll, we'll get into the specifics of that. But, you know, since we're on the topic, I mean, Will Howard said after the game, we don't want to be the guys to, to break this streak. It is a yeah. big deal. And multiple players were kind of tiptoeing around. You know, uh, it's not that big of a deal. But then you had some players, and I love DJ Giddens. Let me just say, DJ Giddens might be my favorite human being of all time. What a and, sweet soul. Yeah. And somebody asked him after the game, hey, what was the celebration like in the locker room? And, like, I think it might have been a Kansas City area reporter who didn't really know DJ. And I, me personally, I would never ask DJ about celebrating because I don't even think DJ smiles. But DJ said, yeah, we were we were all turned. We were, I was turned. And he kind of chuckled and that got a good reaction from his teammates on social media. But um, that just goes to show that this game is, is important. And um, Cooper Beebe said after the game, I asked Cooper, is this why he came back? And he goes, yeah, th- these are the, th- this is the reason why these kind of games are the reasons why I came back. And it means a lot to those guys. And um, I-, I really believe if KU was going to end this streak, this would have been the year to do it. I mean, you you have a you, you're, this is the most talented KU's been in a long time. Um, K State at times has struggled this year, but anytime you're at home with a good team and a night game, this would have been the year to do it. Next year is going to be tough. It's obviously going to be in Manhattan again, and K State plays really well at home. But man, just what a great college football game! And I'm happy that this rivalry is back to a point where it can be called a rivalry. Yeah, I would have been interested to see if Bean had played what their offensive scheme would have been. It would have been this. Mm-hmm. I mean, they they did a lot of things here to try to close the gap. And I'm going to be really blunt here. I, I like Jason Bean a lot. He's done wonders for them and in a weird situation over there. But I don't think Cole Ballard did anything Jason Bean wouldn't have done. Maybe break a longer run. I don't know. But uh, I thought, man, that kid's a freshman walk-on. And he's their third stringer. He's going to be a great backup to Jalen Daniels next season. Now that JD has announced he's coming back for another season, that'll pump up the volume for 2024 in MHK, but we'll get to that later. Um, Defensively, Cole, I thought uh, the defense was on its heels the entire night. As you mentioned, Austin Moore, 
they, they simply didn't expect that much junk. And I, I don't mean that as an insult. It was just, you know, all this stuff you throw into your playbook, maybe we'll use this. And uh, Andy Kotalicki used it. Uh, and, and it was, uh, I think the thing I'm most impressed with <clears throat> isn't as much as the play calling, but as the players g- adapting to all of that stuff without procedure penalties. And, you know, we haven't run this much. And um, I, I was just really impressed how prepared the players were. Not not just the game day execution by the coaches, the calls, and the plays, but that the players were able to run that stuff so efficiently. But um, at the end of the day, K-State made the plays. And I'm going to be blunt here. that They've been – They've been pounding their chest over hiring Sean Snyder. This game was decided by special teams. This this game was decided by special teams. And and not necessarily in, hey, K-State made more great plays. KU didn't protect on an extra point and got it blocked. Well, there's minus one. But then nobody reacted to it. And next thing you know, uh, K-State's scooping and scoring for two points. There's a three-point swing. They muff a punt. At midfield would have been great field position. Nope, K State gets it back and, and gets to keep going. Um, this game, if you look at the the swing in points here, uh, in so many areas, it was all special teams related that that gave K State the winning points. Um, and uh, uh, credit to the K State coaches, uh, they they just went out there and did their thing. But um, I I just found a lot of irony in it, Cole Carmody, a lot of irony. You know why those four points are important, Fitz? And I don't know if many people have talked about this, but if you were to just play football like you play baseball, where each touchdown is a point, this game is tied at four to four. KU scored mm-hmm. four touchdowns. K State scored four touchdowns. The difference was that blocked extra point. So essentially, what that caused is it gave K State an opportunity after that to then go for two because they wanted to be up, you know, by a specific amount of points. Well, sure enough, they did that, and it was the correct call because they won the game by four. And that's huge because at the very last drive of the game, instead of Kansas going down and being able to kick a field goal to win the game potentially, they have to score a touchdown to win the game. Now, at the very end, I still believe maybe KU should have tried to kick that field goal and take the points there, and maybe you rely on your defense to get a stop. Then all you need is another field goal. Um they didn't get the ball back. So, you know, ultimately I guess it was the right decision to try and go for the kill shot there. But um, that's the difference right there. Fitz that blocked extra point then allowed Kansas state to go for two. And when they got that KU was chasing points the entire game, biggest play of the game. That might've been the biggest play of the season for K state, because if they don't block that extra point, who knows what happens? I remember sitting up there in the press box saying that is going to matter because that is a big play. And, I mean, K-State special teams wasn't great. There was a kickoff out of bounds. There was a long return for KU. But when they needed to make the big play, they made the big play. That's not something we've seen so far this year, and it came at the perfect time. But again, it just goes back to that mold. K-State has always been better at KU at special teams. Think back to Phillip Brooks returning two punts for a touchdown against them in 2020. Every year, even last year, KU muffs a punt. Echo Boydo gets it. K-State scores on the next play. Every year, K-State makes a big play on special teams, and it leads to Kansas's demise. And once again, that held true on Saturday. It sure did. It was uh, – I remember seeing that block to respond. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Oh, oh, there, yeah. There, okay, now it's huge because not only did it swing points, instead of having a full touchdown lead, you're only up by, what, four. Mm-hmm. Um, but suddenly you just lost the momentum that you had come to grab a hold of because you were going to take a touchdown lead on mighty Kansas state that you haven't beaten uh, since your players were, I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to sound like I'm insulting them, but they were learning to wipe their butts and stuff. I mean, it was, it was been that long. I guess it's a little bit of exaggeration, but anyhow, it's, 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 it's got a way on them. And, and then to see their, their momentum just disappear, evaporate, had to be really painful. Let's get to the boss. You brought him up, DJ Giddens. Man, I, uh, I, I thought, uh, in all seriousness, I thought, oh, uh, excuse me, Oklahoma. Where did that come from? Kansas <laughs> State's offensive line um, was okay. 
I, I think they, you know, Will Howard brought it up in the post game that they did a good job of, um, you know, mixing up what they were doing. So it confused what the blocking scheme should be, who's got who. But DJ Giddens didn't care. DJ Giddens doesn't care. You know, bring him at me. I'm going to, I'm going to get around him one by one. I am, he has such a cool running style of just sifting through uh, traffic and breaking hand tackles and sometimes, you know, more significant tackles just keeps going and going until they they can just wrestle him down like a bear (laughs) i i enjoy watching it's such a contrast from what we saw from deuce vaughn but in a game like this when you need to power the ball up the field and particularly at the end of the game he's the guy he's perfect for this he was impressive 21 rushes 102 yards with a long of 18 fits what that tells me is he didn't break very many quote-unquote long runs he was four yards three yards in a cloud of dust and that's what they needed we talked about going into this game i i truly felt like k-state had a massive advantage on the interior and and fits i'll I'll just say it i don't know if there's a more improved position group on this team than the offensive line from the start of the season until now they have improved so much and the way that they were able to just consistently, DJ said after the game, it always felt like there were like four or five yards that were the offensive line just created for me. And he had some negative rushes, no doubt about that. I would probably attribute that more to play calling and, you know, schematics. Um, but you take out those two plays where he got a negative four yard rush and a negative six yard rush, and he's 115 yards. And so um, he, he ran the ball really well. K-State as a team, 37 attempts for 166 yards, but that also includes negative 25 yards uh, as a team rush at the end of the game. So essentially they ran for close to 200 yards on about 34 uh, attempts. Again, I I thought that the running game was outstanding. And Will Howard, you look at Will Howard on the day, four yard or four attempts for 18 yards. Um, That does include a sack. So he he actually ran the ball a little bit better than that. Um, He did have a touchdown along a 15. I, I was a little surprised they didn't put Avery Johnson in this game because I felt like if there was one area where K-State could have exposed Kansas, it would be on the quarterback run game. And so the fact that they didn't do that, I, I was a little surprised about, but it was very obvious that Will Howard was their guy. They were sticking with him. And he, even though he was a little dinged up, because he definitely looked dinged up after one of the sacks, Will Howard was still able to go in there, use his legs. And again, it was the ground game that really led K-State's offense. Yeah, I mean, I was really surprised they didn't go to Avery at some point, just schematically and also maybe to give Will a break, but they just stayed the course. Um, and again, we don't we don't get to watch these players in practice. We don't know what's going on. Uh, we don't talk to them in the locker room. We don't get their inner psychology that the coaches do. They were faithful to Will, again, just like they were at Texas. And uh, he delivered. He absolutely delivered. Uh, that last drive was, you know, to put it away was really impressive. I'm I'm so sick of replay. I, I I'm just yeah. I don't know what we're doing in football anymore. If a guy catches the ball inbounds, a guy tries to jostle his arm as he shoves him out. His hands never leave the ball. Um, the position of the ball might change because he's getting his arm yanked on, um, and he's now got a foot out of bounds. <laughs> and they still want to say, but maybe you can break it up. I mean it. I, I don't even know what we're doing anymore with replay and possession. Um, I've always believed that if you caught the ball and you end up in the end zone or out, of, eventually out of bounds, the play's over at that point. But no, apparently in this new football world, you get to keep playing. Um, I, I just am blown away, though, at how K-State ran out that clock because KU knew it was coming, and at the very end, they couldn't stop it. Um, and as you mentioned... Uh, the the key stats here kind of bore through. KU had to make some big plays to get to the end zone um, because they're bad. They're not very good in the red zone, and we saw it at the end of the game. Mm-hmm. K-State gets into the end zone, but KU can't stop anyone in the red zone. And I would imagine, I don't have the stats pulled up right now. Uh, you might. I would imagine that red zone trips were four for four for K-State. Um, yep, four of four. That Kansas was three of four. Um, mm-hmm. So they did better than usual, but um, yeah, the, everything pregame we saw about this game came to light. Um, maybe the game wasn't quite as well executed by either team as I thought, but um, it was it was pretty spot on what we thought this game would play out. I, I'm I, as I get to finally a question here, Cole. 
uh, I'm just blown away by the progress Lance Leipold has made in, mm-hmm. in three years. I'm, mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm going to be blunt here. He didn't take over anything nearly as bad as Bill Snyder. And he's got access to the transfer portal, which was so important from the very start when he took a bunch of players from Buffalo. I bet you Buffalo was pissed, but I took a bunch of players to Buffalo to almost seed his locker room with the positivity that he was looking for. Um, and, and this is a really good football team. I, I wouldn't want to see them in a bowl if they get Jason Bean back here pretty soon. It's uh, it's a really good football team, and congratulations to Kansas State. They finally got it right. They wandered around in the desert for so long hiring crappy coaches with ADs that kept hiring the next guy based on the previous guy. Um, okay, we had a fat guy. Let's get a skinny guy. Let's go get a fat guy. <laughs> Um, it's, it, I mean, it was just crazy. It, and this guy's got it right. And seeing Leipold and Kleiman hug before the game, you know, you, it wasn't just two coaches. These these dudes are friends. Yeah. These dudes know each other. They respect each other. They came up from the lower levels of college football to, to be succeeding at the Power Five. They probably have a really incredible connection. Oh yeah, you can tell that there's definitely there's definitely a friendship there. And after the game, Lance Leipold said, "You know, the gap is closed, but it's not close enough yet." I think that's a great way of describing it, Fitz, because KU has closed the gap significantly. I mean, you look at these total stats on the game: KU 396 yards, um, 234 yards rushing, uh, only one less first down than K State, five of 11 on third downs. They only ran four less plays. Time of possession was in favor of the Jayhawks by eight minutes, three or four in the red zone. It just goes back to special teams. And and honestly, Fitz, I truly believe the reason why K-State won this game is because they still have better players. I mean, uh, KU was in this. Yes, overall. KU was in this game because of the way that they scheme things. And that is not a knock on the players at all. They they were in great position to win. But I, I once had an old high school football coach, um, you know, in, in Kansas high school football, you see a lot of uh, triple option and wishbone and flex bone. And he described it as Mickey Mouse BS. And I'm not going to say that what Kansas did was Mickey Mouse BS because it absolutely gashed K-State. But there is a place and a time for a bit of a gimmicky offense. And when you have Terry Lachlan, who has four attempts at rushing the football, Devin Neal, who has 18, I would venture to say at least 10 of those would be off of wildcat runs. Um, you, you're just not going to win a lot of football games. You, you're just not. At some point, you have to trust your quarterback. And I thought Cole Ballard did a great job, but there were some some mistakes he made. Um, the interception to Kobe Savage specifically. I know it didn't end up hurting um, the Jayhawks because Will Howard would throw it right back. Which, by the way, how did Ben Sennett got absolutely mugged? I have no idea how there wasn't a flag on that um, interception. Uh, nonetheless. Um, he throws that interception in the end zone as well. It felt like K-State said, we're going to sell out to stop this Wildcat offense, and if Cole Ballard beats us, congratulations. I, I was a little surprised that KU didn't try and change their um, offense in the second half. They knew that K-State would come out and adjust, and that's how the, that, that separates the good coaches from the great coaches. The coaches who can anticipate the other teams being able to adjust – are the difference. Um, okay, you didn't do that, but still, I mean, it, this was a great football game. And again, I just keep going back to it, Fitz, but like, this is what college football is supposed to be. Well, I'm going to disagree with you. I think K is doing exactly what they need to do right now with Andy Kotalicki in this offense. The, the pre-motion or the pre-snap motions and trades and all the stuff they do, um, particularly against a defense like K-State that had a true freshman middle linebacker playing a lot of the game, It's going to confuse you. You're going to be maybe a half a step out of your gap. Uh, And we saw that. We we Mm -hmm. saw that happen. They move people around, and all of a sudden, boom, there's the hole. There's a brilliance to it. I I asked Bill Snyder, um, as we sneak up here on our first break, I asked Bill Snyder during my Life of Fitz podcast with him this this last summer um, about his evolution from five wide, essentially running the spread before the spread was the spread running five wide to, you know, becoming such a ground game quarterback run game. And he said, well, Fitz, at the start, we were doing what we had to do to win and be Mm -hmm. competitive. Mm -hmm. We were just, we didn't have enough quality offensive linemen. uh, So we had to spread them out and make them, you know, not be able to blitz us all the time. 
And um, I was, you know, that's just, that's good coaching. Um, I, I don't think Lance Leipold or Chris Kleiman are going anywhere. But if I'm Kansas, I'm really worried about someone coming after their offensive coordinator. Uh, because this guy, um, for building a program, he gives you a better chance to win. And I can see him in the Big Ten West next year with a new coach taking over one of those programs. Or if I'm Luke Fickle at Wisconsin, I'm looking at this guy who spent a lot of time at, in Whitewater uh, calling plays uh, that let's try to get him home. I don't know what the Wisconsin's offense was, but um, we're, we've seen a lot of absolute junk um, from the Big Ten West. And this offense would absolutely run roughshod over uh, you know, anything that they want to put out there in that conference, um, in that division. So I don't know. I, I it's, that's the real challenge here. And it's trying to keep a hold of your offensive coordinator. Cause he's, he's going to need some big money. And, and I hope, I hope for KU's sake, they can pay him. But and as a guy that covers Kansas state and knows how invested K state is, it'd be nice to see him move on. Let's, let's see if you can hit another <laughs> offensive coordinator higher the way you did. Well, that's it for the first half of the power cat post-game podcast. Cole is in KC. I'm here in MHK, and we're going to get this knocked out because Cat Basketball is coming up this afternoon. You need to be tuned in if you've got the CBS Sports Network. Um, It's K-State and Nigel Pax, Miami Hurricane, playing in the championship game down in the Bahamas Championship, and uh, it'll be a good test for for, uh, Jerome Tang's bunch, although it sounds like Day Day Ames won't be playing, which is kind of BS if you ask me. We'll be right back. GoPowerCat.com's PowerCat podcast continues after this short break. Is your January looking dry? Get some lotion, get a humidifier, and better yet, get Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery. With Drizzly, you can compare prices across local stores to get the best price on a huge selection of drinks perfect for dry January. Every single time. Non-alcoholic wines? Have a look. Ready-made mocktails? Grab a straw and order them up. Beer without the alcohol? Yep, take your pick. You can find all of them here, in the app, in that phone that's in your hand. Could it be any simpler? Nope, not a chance. So shop for great deals on all your dry January beverages or other drinks and get them delivered to your door or blanket fort, maybe. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. And don't forget to lotion up your elbows. They're looking a little dry. Welcome back to the Power Cat Podcast. Welcome back to the Power Cat Post Game Podcast. Fitz and Coles, not in the same place. And the dogs are behaving. Everything is well right now in the world of K-State athletics. What a weekend for K-State sports. We've seen a basketball team win. A volleyball team get another 3-0 sweep. Um, the women's basketball team knocking off second-ranked Iowa on the road. Um, and now K-State wins the Abolition Bowl uh, for the 15th straight time. I'm just I'm just going to keep saying it, man. That's gonna good. Going to keep working it. Um, and uh, now we'll see what K-State basketball can do this afternoon, which is probably done by the time a lot of you are listening to this. That got confusing at the end, Cole. I'm. I'm just off my game. Sunday mornings aren't made for podcasting. They're meant for me staying in bed. Good thing it's the afternoon when we're recording this. Oh, it is now. <laughs> it is now. K-State wins uh, in Lawrence 31-27 in a uh, really entertaining nail-biter of a game. Um, uh, Cole, I, I heard a uh, prominent KU uh, blogger, I don't even know how to describe this, Jack Wagon, have an unhinged meltdown cursing at will howard look i understand investment in your your team rah rah but i'm gonna say this folks if if your team unhinges you to the point of possibly murdering someone and certainly threatening someone's life you know very very uh your day is coming it sounds like a threat to on someone's life to me maybe check your your chemical imbalance or maybe get some priorities in your life that don't involve college athletics or any athletics uh, because wow um i don't know man i've never seen a case theater go that far 
Um, but it's uh, it means a lot to these fan bases, and I think that defines very much why it's important in the locker rooms. And Cole, you ready? And why it's more important in the K State locker room. Mm-hmm. Half of this roster are Kansas kids. Nearly half of the depth chart are Kansas kids, and that isn't reflected in Lawrence, and for good reason. There's not enough Kansas kids to go around. And K-State has the corner on the market. They will continue to corner that market. Um, But KU got one Kansas kid. They didn't have to go far to get him. But by God, Cole, Devin Neal, I knew he was special. He was even more special. This kid is an NFL running back. Mm -hmm. He is so good. Um, Good tacklers for K-State couldn't get him down. And that that's all compliment to him. I don't think it was K-State bad tackling. I just think he just runs through everything. He's like he's greased up and ready to go. Um, and it's – man, he's good. He had, what, 138 last night? 138. So that's, uh, that's an impressive outing. 7.7 yards a rush as well. Ouch. So that, that was really good for Devin Neal. I, I want to touch on what you said at the very beginning of this, uh, of this half. I – I think that there's a lot of drama that gets started on social media. And I think for fans who are listening to this podcast, who might get caught up in it. I think it's important to realize that Twitter is not a real place. Like no. sometimes as fans, you know, and, and I, I'm guilty of this myself, especially with the chiefs, right? Like, you know, I, I'm a chiefs fan and I, you can get caught up in some of the stuff that's on social media, some of the stuff that gets put out there on Twitter, but it's just not a real place. And so I always try and, you know, look at the best in people, but it is really hard, especially when you are a prominent and really a public image like that. And you're out there when, when you put yourself out there and you speak like that to where the whole world can see it, it doesn't reflect, reflect well. And there are a lot of Kansas fans that know a lot about football. There are a lot of Kansas fans that I've talked to who said, this is a great game. The better team won. Um, but I, I don't think, you know, if you're a K-State fan listening to this, that you should take this individual's word as gospel. Honestly, some people just exist to try and piss you off. I think that's one of those people. So that's what I want to say about that. I want to talk about Devin Neal now because that kid is outstanding. I mean, he is one heck of a football player. I was honestly surprised that he didn't throw the ball because this is a kid who was a center fielder at Lawrence High School. At Lawrence High School, He played baseball at KU for a year. He actually played at KU before he decided, you know, I'm pretty good at this football thing. Um, I was surprised they didn't have a play where he didn't throw it because he has an arm. You should see Fitz when he was in high school, he had one of the best arms in the state from the outfield. He's touching 90 from the outfield. It's not like he can't throw the ball. So I was a little surprised they didn't have a play for him to throw it. Um, But again, he didn't have to 7.7 yards of rush is absolutely ridiculous. He looked like Deuce Vaughn. I mean, the way he was able to just not get tackled that's exactly who I thought. I mean, K-State would have him stopped uh, for a two-yard gain, then he would just break away and get three more yards. And it was like, oh, well, like, how, how does this happen? You go back to a, a play where the K-State had stuffed a trap play in the backfield. It was going to be a six-yard loss, and somehow Devin Neal gets three or four yards. It's like that was not supposed to happen. But, again, it's a credit to that offense. I, again, when you are – when you're out, when you're outgunned, and you have a Cole Ballard at quarterback, again, he's going to be a good quarterback. He's going to he he will play at KU eventually. Um, you have to try and do things a little bit differently, just like you mentioned in the first half, and they did. Um, it eventually caught up with them, but man, that that offense really is fun to watch. Yeah, it is. Um, he's special. Um, heck, I like. I saw a lot also. Mm-hmm. I think he's really good. He was less effective in this game, uh, just as, you know, to some degree, Treshawn Ward was. He had the, the, he had 63 yards rushing on seven carries. 52 came on one play. So six, six other plays for 11 yards. He was really struggling until that huge play. And let's not, let's not skim over that play. Um, right after a dropped pick six, probable pick six for KU, he goes 52 yards right up the gut and kind of changes the everything about that possession and and field position, all that good stuff. But um, yeah, uh, it was fun to see Giddens and Neil going head to head. This that was my daily delivery on Sunday. Two Kansas kids. You know, we're told repeatedly Kansas doesn't produ- produce enough talent. Well, Devin Neal was a little bit more recruited than DJ Giddens, but um, I don't think they both uh, 
got nearly the recruiting attention they deserved as it translate to what they became as college players. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, we see a lot of kids get a lot of recruiting attention and then become okay college players. Um, we see a lot of kids in Kansas get ignored or not get much attention at all. And that has been the secret sauce for K-State football, that getting the Jordy Nelson that was completely passed over by everyone to walk on. Um, the walk-on list is long and storied at Kansas State, continues with an Austin Moore. Um, and the Porter brothers and so many guys that are just regular contributors to this program. Um, and, and that's really where it is for K-State. You, you continue to get the walk-on program, and I don't know one out of – I don't even know what the, the mathematics are. One out of 20 end up being significant mm-hmm. players, and another you know, five end up being contributors and great practice and special teams guys put you in advantage and that's where k-state is that's why they continue to dominate this this game means more to k-state and it also um they're just they're getting enough of those quality depth guys bo palmer let's talk about yes him. i wasn't at the game i don't know if austin romaine uh got injured um or just wasn't playing well bo palmer walk on out of kansas city who has been injured a lot himself ends up on the field during the most crucial defensive moments of this game at freaking middle linebacker and he played he played really well i was blown away by how effective he was and a a brilliant tipped pass in coverage that almost led to an interception by bull palmer Uh, on and on he kept positioning himself well um and and that's great coaching we didn't see that kind of depth i'm gonna be blunt here we didn't see that kind of depth step on the field and play at these levels under bill steiner that was always kind of the weakness of the program they did when they got into injuries there was a yep. significant drop off k-state keeps playing under chris Kleiman. it's it's really impressive cole Bo palmer desmond pernell austin moore all were out at linebacker in the fourth quarter those are three kansas kids lewisburg high school topeka hayden high school and, of course, Bo Palmer, the pride of Ryan Wallace's alma mater, Blue Valley High. Um, it was awesome. And I think the reason why Bo Palmer was in the game, and, and Chris Kleiman really didn't come out and say it in post game, He mentioned it. But with all those trade shifts and motions, which Kleiman mentioned several times in the post game, I think they felt like they needed a veteran in there. And Bo Palmer is a guy who's been around. He's a redshirt junior. He's been around and played. But that is a guy who they trust with his eyes maybe a little bit more than with Austin Romaine. And that's what right. that option is all about. It's about trusting your eyes, reading your keys. And he did that. I mean, he was outstanding. Now, is he very fast? No. But if he is in between the tackle box, is he going to make the tackle? Yes, he is. And he did a great job. He had a huge sack in the fourth quarter, which I think some people might forget about. Uh, that was a huge play. He wrapped up Ballard, brought him to the ground. Uh, it was outstanding, Fitz. Watching Bo Palmer, I just had a giant smile on my face because that is a kid who has been through so much. People forget he tore his ACL last year. He was going to play, and then he tore his ACL. He's come back. He's made a con- contribution on the defensive side of the football. And and I want to talk about a guy, and I don't know if you were going to bring him up, but I think it's worth mentioning, Fitz. I'm going to ask you this. If you were to name the top two receivers right now without looking at statistically, who would be the two top leading receivers for K-State? I think that's a fairly easy question. I'm not looking at the stats. Uh, J.C. Brown and uh, uh, top uh, 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 overall, it's Phil Brooks or Ben Sennett, but yeah, I don't know. Where are you going with so this? The question is, the, who's the third leading receiver? And you got it. It's Jace Brown. I mean, yeah. Shocking. This is a kid who who has not hardly played. He didn't hardly play at all in the beginning part of the season. Now he has 17 receptions for 316 yards and two touchdowns. Fitz, that's 18.6 yards a catch. This is a kid who is a difference maker when the ball is thrown to him. I He had an outstanding game. That catch and run on third down, I mean, that was just absolutely massive. They had been running across and routes all game. He ran a whip route and caught it, got the first down. I mean – maybe the play of the game um, offensively. This kid is special. I mean, he is special. And I I feel like the connection he has with Avery Johnson is only going to take him to the next level next year. But right now, I mean, you can make an argument. He's the most dynamic player on this offense. Well, the first play of the game, I mean, they had scripted it out. They don't script plays, but uh, if they got a look, they were going to go with this play. Can you imagine? They just designed their 
first play of the game to be a deep ball to a true freshman receiver who didn't come into the playing rotation until, I don't know, how long ago was that? Four weeks ago? Five weeks ago? After Texas Tech, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and he was there. He didn't have the guy beat totally, but he made the catch and, and set the tone early. But uh, that tone didn't hold up, unfortunately, for K-State as, as KU decided uh, to continue to answer. Um, but, uh, yeah, they, they, they've got some young players in this program. This freshman class – um, everyone talks about Avery, um, but they, they've just got so many dudes. There's just so many dudes down there that are saving their their eligibility and that will, you know, not burn that year. Um, but Jace Brown's one that you had to play. You just had to put him out mm-hmm. there because you weren't getting enough uh, oomph from the receivers. Um, and look, um, I mentioned Phil Brooks there. We had one catch. We'll all remember that one catch yeah. uh, when the game was on the line. I thought he'd go to Senate. Um, that's what they tried to do at Texas, and Texas saw it coming. Um, so they went to to Phil Brooks, and I don't know how he kept hold of the ball. He's got a guy yanking on his arm at full strength. I mean, maybe that was old man strength from Phil Brooks to hold on to that, that ball, but uh, he made the play. He knew the significance of it. Uncle Phil, as they like to call him. Um, he, he is, isn't it amazing how Philip Brooks has just consistently been consistent, right? Like that is the, that is, that is the definition of who Philip Brooks is. I don't think people are going to appreciate Philip Brooks as much as they probably should. Um, he's not a special player, but he shows up every single game and he grinds his tail off. Um, he has a great connection with Will Howard and, you know, there was some question as to if, if Philip Brooks was even going to come back last year. May, yep. Maybe people thought he might transfer or just, you know, go try and take it to the next level. And here he comes back, and he's been here in the last two seasons. He's been great. You know, you, you talk about Jace Brown and, and, and that freshman class, and I think that's where we're seeing a difference with this Kansas State team and the program in general. Um, Jace Brown is an outlier, but typically K-State has been recruiting at a much higher level. I think it's important to note, and I know we've talked about it on this show before, but Jace Brown obviously is a Kansas State Wildcat. The only other Power 5 offer he had, he didn't have another Power 5 offer. It was just K-State. Tulane and Air Force would be in the two biggest programs to offer him that were outside of Kansas State, and now he's come in and been the best freshman in this class. Um, yeah, it's just it's incredible what Chris Kleiman is building, and as I'm assuming – we're going to talk about here to wind down the show culture. I mean, mm-hmm. that is the reason why K state won this game. They had better players. I would agree that with that. Um, but culture K state has a winning culture. KU is starting to build that. But when yep. the, but when the going got tough, the tough got going and Chris Kleiman has done an outstanding job of building up this program and, and fits. They're getting to a spot now where they are about to ascend to be on a national level. I agree. I agree. They they continue to build and climb. The season has played out a lot like last season. They're just not going to get the tiebreaker breaks unless something miraculous happens next uh, Saturday. And um, Texas Tech, I'm talking to you. Um, I, <laughs> and, and let's cover that real quick because uh, people are wondering how Kansas State could end up in the Big 12 championship. Um, and, and the two scenarios basically are this. Everyone... Okay, so Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Kansas State are tied. When I say everyone, I mean those three. And Texas has one game up. Everyone wins, except Texas loses at home to Texas Tech, which I don't see happening. That creates a four-way tie that, as of now, works. I I mean, I think it works in K-State's advantage. Before this game, and I don't think it changed, it was K-State and Oklahoma that come out of that four-way tie and go to Arlington, which would be incredible. That's the way it should end. We think. We think. We think that's the way it should end in the in, for the Big Twelve in this scenario is yeah. K State beating Oklahoma one more time because mm-hmm. um, uh, that would be significant. Uh, or or um, since the Big Twelve uh, clarified, not altered, clarified their rules um, that changed the outcome of the tiebreakers, um, <laughs> but that wasn't a change at all. Um, and look, they got they got it right. This is the way it should be, but you typically don't screw someone over by changing the rules in the middle of the stream. But um, Oklahoma and Oklahoma State both need to lose. Not one, both need to lose because and then there will be no tiebreaker. 
Um, if one loses, K State loses the tiebreaker to either team. They lost Oklahoma State, and then you go to the the, the top opponents since they didn't play Oklahoma, and they they beat Texas. Oklahoma beat Texas, and K State didn't. They lose those head to head tiebreakers. Um, but uh, if you're going to both lose, then you're the outright number two, and there's no tiebreaker involved. Um, so that's it. You either get Texas to lose and everyone to win. Because, folks, if everyone doesn't win and Texas loses, the tiebreakers are different, and I don't think K-State wins those tiebreakers. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just kind of a weird thing. In all likelihood, they will not be playing in Arlington. My travel budget appreciates that, (laughs) uh, but I think this team could win that game if if given the chance. But don't look past Iowa State either, Cole. Cyclones played the Longhorns tough. They've been tough. They've been persistent. They're not flashy. They just – I'm going to say this. They're built like a – Big Ten West team. They, they suck the life out of the game. They play a lot of defense. They make just enough plays. Kansas State just needs to come out and assert itself offensively next Saturday. That game's been set for 7 p.m. It'll be nationally televised on Fox. Welcome to the big time. It took you the entire season, Kansas State, <laughs> to get on get on that channel um, without the assistance of OU or Texas. But uh, it's, it's a big game. Uh, Iowa State will be coming in wanting to win this edition of Farmageddon. It's going to be a, a fun last weekend of football, isn't it? Yep. And, you know, the best part about it is, Fitz, we're going to know exactly um, what the scenario is. K State plays at seven o'clock. So, you know what? There could be some added intensity there. It could be a win to get in scenario. But really, we should know on Saturday because Oklahoma plays TCU at 11 o'clock and on Friday before right. the game's on Saturday. So if OU loses to TCU, then K State fans, then it becomes real because then you hope for a uh, an Oklahoma State loss, which then happens at two thirty. Um, if you want to know where Texas plays, they play six thirty against Texas Tech. So oh, that's on every, Friday, right? And that is on Friday as well. Right. So K State will know exactly what happens. And honestly, Fitz, it, it wouldn't shock me if one of those teams loses and it comes down to a you know a, it's going to be one game. You know that's how it always works like that. It doesn't ever go as planned. There is going to be something that happens. There's going to be a chance for K-State there. Um, but nonetheless, if they can find a way to beat Iowa State, you finish 9-3. and three. When was the last time K-State won nine games in a regular season in back-to-back years? I don't know the answer to that question. But again, not two straight 9-3 and three seasons with a chance at 10 wins for two years in a row. Um, you're setting yourself up nicely for the future in the 12-team playoff in the new Big 12. But this has been a fun season. I'm excited to see how K-State wraps it up on senior night with a lot of deserving seniors to get some honors. Um, it's been a great season, and Farmageddon is going to be a blast. Uh, yeah, they, they got some seniors this year that uh, might need like a walker because they're so old. <laughs> uh, yeah. But that's, that's the pandemic for you. Um, we'll see what Saturday holds. This past Saturday was a nail biter, but K State got out of Lawrence with a 31 27 victory. The 15th straight year, the Wildcats have won in this series. And congratulations. You had to be, um, if you were in college with KU leading this series uh, in your lifetime, you're over 90 years old. And congratulations on being that old if you actually saw KU winning more games than K-State. It's incredible. It's incredible how dominating they were in the 1910s. Congratulations, (laughs) KU. We'll always have that. Thanks, Cole. Appreciate it. Get back to Manhattan. You got kids to teach on Monday, don't you? Mm. Mm. Nope, we're on break. Oh, you're on break? Totally. Yep. Oh, that's right. It's Thanksgiving. Now kids get off in a whole week for Thanksgiving. Yeah. We didn't. We had to work on Thanksgiving. We had to go hunt our turkeys, and then we had to stuff them, and then we we did it all. But we didn't have we didn't we had to do it with like sticks because that's how old I am. We're done. Thank you for listening to the Power Cat Podcast. Make sure you're subscribing to our show at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. With Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked. Temperature set. Lost car found. There it is. Get complimentary class leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562-314-4603 for complete details. You ready to ride? 
I thought you'd never ask. Now streaming on Paramount Plus, it's the new original series, Lawmen, Baz Reeves. Baz dedicated to justice. From executive producer Taylor Sheridan, co creator of Yellowstone, starring executive producer and Emmy Award nominated actor David Oyelowo, it's the untold story. I'm warning you. Of the greatest American lawman. Your wicked days are done. Lawmen, Bass Reeves, new original series, now streaming exclusively on Paramount Plus.